Thank you so much. What a great group. And it's not me, it's the topic. That's what makes it so exciting. Um, I have lumbar stenosis, which diagnosis says you're not going to be able to stand very long, Mrs. Egbo. So I will sit here, but you don't need to look at me because I have put in everything up there. I will begin by telling I'm a historian for Oakland County Park, so what do I do? We have 14 original parks. We have a new one, Pontiac Oaks, the old Hawthorne Park. And then we have a new one, Southfield Oaks, which is encompassed within Beach Woods Park in Southfield. And we are working with three communities, Hazel Park, Royal Oak Township, and Oak Park to develop parks. 19. My job? the history of the land and the people that have become a park from indigenous history through today. So it's about 8,000 years of history, which clearly keeps me busy. And because I'm spread all over the county, I essentially function as Oakland County's historian. So I do a lot with community, economic development and community affairs, a lot with people trying to figure out who built their house and when, so that's kind of fun. But today I want to talk about uh, an area I've been really passionate and interested in for several years. That, that's the indigenous connections. And I'm going to start with a disclaimer. I am no expert. <laughs> I am not. I am a learner. I really am. I've been on a journey to try and learn more. And here's why. I have discovered I have a gap in my brain. A gap that has just been there for a while. I will bet a bunch of you have that same gap. Not on purpose, but just because we weren't given information over time. Indigenous history wasn't viewed as important or part of American history. I'll give you an example. Wisner School. How many know Wisner School? Oh, yeah. I went to Wisner School, and like every elementary in Pontiac, there was that huge portrait of Chief Pontiac. But no one ever told him he was Odawa, that he was an amazing leader who pulled together these diverse groups in a unified effort to stop the taking of indigenous land. The only thing I ever remember learning was that he was buried on Apple Island, which we know is absolutely false. So I, I didn't have much. And then my own town, I learned things like this. There it was, as you can see on this Michigan map from 1823, Pontiac was Michigan's first inland settlement. Well, that makes sense. Until you look at Wilbur Hinsdale map, where he placed indigenous settlements, one right at where Pontiac would grow. So wait a minute. If it was the first indigenous settlement, but it was built on top of a much older settlement, how can that be true? So we really have to kind of rethink how we do history. We tend to begin with people building log cabins and mills in Oakland County. That's an important part of our history, and nobody's taking that away. You know, when you add in indigenous history, you don't have to take other stuff out. There's room in history for everybody. I always say that. And inclusive history is real history. If you're not telling the whole story, you're not telling your history. And that's what I want to do today. So really, I've been working on trying to fill in my gap. And for me, it began with a project I did with the Michigan Department of Transportation. It was called Ancestors, Archaeology, and the Anishinaabe. It was the first time I worked with prehistoric artifacts. I'm trained in historical archaeology. Outhouses, old mill sites, old foundations, cool stuff. But not lithics, not stone artifacts, not stone tools. So that was a really good experience for me, but it wasn't the artifacts. It was the people I got to work with. We had representatives from eight of our 12 federally recognized tribes who were there, who were cultural specialists and education specialists. I was hired as the educational specialist to create a curriculum out of the project I got the education. I was the one who got a time to rethink how indigenous people view time and place. So that was a huge point for me in 2016. So what I did then, I brought you a list of some of the books I've learned to read along the way and learn from. And then I also am bringing you today indigenous voices. Indigenous people 
telling important things. So you're not just hearing Egbo, you're hearing from indigenous people. So starting at the beginning, the Great Lakes region, Anishinaabek Aki, which is really the land of the Anishinaabek, which you can see was the entire Great Lakes region. Now the Anishinaabek belong to a bigger group of Algonquin-speaking people. These are a linguistic group, and from that, we have several splinter groups, including, oh, here, I'll show you here, pre-contact, before Europeans will get here, the Algonquin-speaking people were spread across North America, very large group. Some of the examples, the Powhatan from Virginia. Remember Jamestown? Well, that was Powhatan land. The Wampanoag pilgrims in Plymouth initially Wampanoag land. And others that you may not think belong connected to the Anishinaabek, like the Cheyenne and the Shawnee. Now they have things in common. I, I like how Zebra Wing Center helps us understand that. Oh, wait, we gotta break the Anishinaabek out. Because they will become three separate groups, the Three Fires Confederacy, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwe. Now, linguistically, a lot in common. Zebuing Center says, think of it like this. We are nations whose languages are similar, not the same, but similar, whose cultures are close, right? and whose lands are often shared. I think that's the best way to think about the three fires and really all of the Algonquin-speaking people. Now here's the problem. We tend to think of the Anishinaabek as people of the past. Yeah, they were way back there. They're gone now, people of the past. They're in old movies. We have to remember the Anishinaabek are here now on pieces of tribal nation land and among our communities. It's important. Some of you, excuse me, may know Eric Hemingway. If you ever get a chance to hear Eric, uh, he is from Little Travers Bay Band of Odawa. Brilliant historian. Oh my goodness, I have learned so much from him. And he always starts a presentation by saying, we're still here, all right? Let me start right like that. We survived and we're moving forward. So we always want to think about not the past, but what about today? So we have 12 federally recognized tribal nations who are sovereign nations who deal with the United States as a sovereign nation. Now, all of them have their own flag. They have their own government, tribal councils. They have their own courts, their own police departments. They have their own constitutions. So they're sovereign nations, and sovereignty is hugely important to the Anishinaabek. Now, we also have state-recognized tribes. These are tribes who have tried to get federal status and have not been able to do that yet. All right, I'll show you in a minute. So these are the four that are only state recognized, okay? Most of them are, are smaller groups. So to do, to get federal recognition, you have to go to the Department of Interior and fit seven criteria that are very, very detailed. Let me give you an example of how hard it is. The Burt Lake Band of, of Ottawa and Chippewa have been trying since 1930 for federal status. Why do you want federal status? Well, access to resources, and more importantly, and ironically, protection of land. It's kind of weird, isn't it? The government who took your land, now when you're federally recognized, can put land in public trust, and it protects your land. So there's advantages to being federally recognized, and we have four that have tried for that, and have not happened that happened. The Burt Lake Band is a very interesting group. It's a small group. Here's 1890. This was their village, which was called Indian Town by people. Um, 1890 photo. October 10th, 1900, a group of white men came in, led by a wealthy lumber baron who wanted that land, and assisted by the local sheriff, pulled people out of the buildings and burnt it to the ground. Now that's not in your history book, is it? That story is neglected history. It's a fairly new one to me. I vaguely knew that it happened, and it wasn't until yesterday I said, I really need to know more about that. 
The story is told in a small, very well-researched book called The Cloud Over the Land. Um, it's available at the Burt Lake Band website for $15 and postage. Oh my goodness. The reason it's not on your resource list is I hadn't found it till yesterday. So this is an important story because it's an example. And we're talking 1900, not 1830 when the, the Removal Act was in there. We're talking about land being taken in 1900. So now we have indigenous land all of Oakland County, all of Michigan. Now, by 1864, indigenous land was reduced to essentially 32 square miles. Think about that. A piece of land four by eight miles. That's astounding. How did that happen? Well, we know it began in 1795 with the Treaty of Greenville. And then there'll be a speed up. You can just watch it happen, treaty after treaty, until essentially, in less than 50 years, we're down to 32 square miles, all right? So land was ceded away, all right? Well, that, they signed treaties. They, they ceded it, they gave it up. Oh, let's think about that for a minute. Land was ceded under duress. There was no treaty that was willingly signed. What kinds of duress? The threat of removal. You know, it's best to have a little piece of your homeland than to lose it all. And that's essentially what the government said. And it was law. You remember Andrew Jackson, 1830, the Native American Removal Act, which essentially said, you have to leave. And if you want to have fishing and hunting rights, you'll leave. Now, they were given initially gathering, hunting, and fishing rights on land that white settlers didn't want yet. As soon as non-indigenous settlers came in, they lost those rights, and that was a huge issue. Eric describes that his tribes had to enter into treaty negotiations with the United States in order to stay in their homelands, even if a small part of it. For the tribes, this meant ceding away millions of acres of ancestral homelands to avoid removal to Kansas and Oklahoma. You know, when you think about Great Lakes indigenous people, the plains of Kansas are not like here. And Oklahoma was worse. Remember that people were moved to Kansas, and then when people came to settle on the plains, they were moved to Oklahoma in these big movements. Treaties were by no means favorable to the Anishinaabek. It was the best the tribes could do with tremendous odds against them. And keep in mind, treaties were hopelessly complicated. When I work with students, I always say, someone read this and explain it to me. I can't even explain it to me. And think about this. They were in English, not Anishinaabawoan, which was the language of the Anishinaabek. No, wait, there were translators. But who were they working for? Exactly. So the language of the treaties. And perhaps most importantly, the way people looked at land was different, all right? Different perspectives that really impacted the treaty process. One of my favorite authors, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote the brilliant bra uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. How many of you ever read a book and you find yourself reading sections over again? And not because you don't get it, you don't understand it, but because it's so beautiful? That's this book. It's amazing. And it's filled with indigenous ways of knowing and believing. And she says, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, natural resources. But to our people, it was everything. Identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained life. It belonged to itself was a gift, not a commodity, so it could never be bought or sold. Remember, if you don't believe that land can be owned, when you sign a treaty, you can't believe you're giving it up because that's not within your world view. So we want to think about commodity versus a gift. When you sit down at a treaty table, land is very different. I like to think of it like this. That big ham I buy at Sam's Club, and then 
this little wooden carved music box that I have that my father gave me when I was eight years old. It played the Blue Danube. And that was because my grandparents from Croatia were born near the Blue Danube. Now, what am I going to treasure more? That ham or that music box? What am I going to pass on to my granddaughter, Elizabeth? It won't be the ham. And that's a different way of looking at land. So then when we think about treaties, let's think about Oakland County and how we were impacted. Well, we were ceded this land in the Treaty of Detroit, 1807. Now, we won't become a county till 1820. The first non-indigenous settlers won't come in till 1818, 1819. So the land, however, is ceded. So indigenous people would still have been here. Now, what you want to think about that treaty is Six million acres were ceded away in exchange for these nine little reserves. There was three Ojibwe, two Potawatomi, an Ojibwe down in Monroe County, and three little Wyandotte. The Wyandotte belonged to the Iroquoian speaker cultural group, a type of Huron. It was a small group, but they were in the Detroit area, so they were part of the treaty. So think about this, six million acres for nine little reserves, which for the most part were one mile by two mile at the greatest. Now the two Potawatomi one are important to us because they are located in what now is Southfield Township here and a southern one that actually went over into Wayne County. It was the Sigunsuins as a reserve and Tonquishes, both Potawatomi chiefs. They had been on that land, had been Potawatomi land for hundreds of years. And so now they gave them this little tiny chunk. Now you notice it says Bloomfield Township. I just told you it was Southfield. Well, a little bit of Oakland County history. 1820, when we became a county, we had just two townships, Oakland and Bloomfield. So early history can be tricky because a whole lot of people lived in Bloomfield that according to land records that really didn't live in Bloomfield. Now, 20 years later, 1827, the Treaty of St. Joseph, both those are taken away. So it's only really for 20 years that they're in existence. Some places to learn more. Clark Historical Library has some excellent information it's on your resource list on Potawatomi removal. But I also suggest go to a Potawatomi Nation website. This is the Pokagon website and read about removal. Removal of Potawatomi. You know, we always think the Trail of Tears, all right? We're taught that, but not the Potawatomi Trail of Tears, the movement to Kansas and Oklahoma. And then this is a great resource. It's a PDF. It was written by the tribal educators of the 12, um, uh, 12 tribal nations. But the it's got some social studies standards and how to do indigenous history with them. But then it has this beautiful map we have access to. And even more importantly, all the tribal nations and their websites. Go to their websites and read there, read their news, read what issues they're dealing with, read their history. It's a wonderful way to learn more. And then I did want to tell you where the, uh, that map came from. This is Helen Tanner's Atlas of the Great Lakes. She was a brilliant historian, anthropologist, and a lot of archaeology background. She did a big book with these beautiful maps which cover indigenous history in the whole Great Lakes region from about 1640 till about 1780. And each map shows the location of villages and what is changing. It's an incredible book. Uh, a historian described it recently as a, a history book on steroids. It, it really is amazing. And what's kind of cool is Helen Tanner's a Michigan woman. Helen Tanner was inducted not that long ago into the Women's Michigan, uh, uh, Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. And it is Michigan Women's History Month, I mean National Women's History Month. So go there and learn a little more about Helen Tanner. But her book is well worth the purchase. So now we, we have two reservations. So that's part of our indigenous history. But what else? 
Well, I said, what about the 1877 Oakland County History Book, that big, thick one? Um, you know, the Oakland County Historical Commission distributed 50 around the county for libraries and things. And I said, it says in the beginning that this is a full and faithful history of Oakland County. <laughs> if that's true, there should be some indigenous history in there. Maybe folks who came, like the Oliver Williams family, maybe they said, who their neighbors' names were, how they were farming, what music they were playing and listening to. So I thought about that. Well, here's how it started. The first settlers found the savages still occupying the country, but they were generally peaceable and gradually, in the course of a few years, disappeared. Poof, they were gone. I think there was more to this story. And savages, the use of that term, we're talking 1870s. Think about that. What does that connotate? And then the township histories. My township, Brandon, after spending my whole life in Pontiac, I took a cultural change and moved to Ortonville. It was a cultural experience. I'm loving it, but it's different. But here, when the first settlers came to Brandon, there were a great many Indians within its bounds. With few exceptions, they were orderly and peaceable, although naturally inclined to pilfer. <laughs> Let's think about this. These are people whose land has been stolen, and now these people say, but you tend to pilfer. Think about that. Another one, White Lake. Despite proverbial habits of painting and making themselves as hideous as possible and a well-known love of strife, they still had many attributes which belong rightfully to a more civilized race. Think about that, that whole idea of not being civilized. And we're talking 1870s, that's not that long ago. So books like this were not very useful for indigenous history. So what do we do? Do we take them off the shelves and put them in a closet? No, because there is some good history in here. But I suggest if you have one of these, you add a disclaimer. You make a point of the fact that they promised a full and faithful history, but it's not. It's not inclusive. I can tell you there are not many African Americans in that book. I think I counted one. And women, there are 125 biographies in that book, and zero are women. So it's not inclusive. But it's got good stuff about the growth of townships and other things and geography. We just have to make sure that we let people know, be careful when you're using this book. And then we have the archaeological record, though. We have a strong one here. And we have a few books of these to give away today, thanks to Mike McGinnis and Dave Decker. If you don't get one, you can purchase one at the Oakland History Center. If you haven't been there, or you haven't been there for a while, you've got to go over there. What a treasure we have in Oakland County. The, the Wisner home, the school, the carriage house, incredible research library. Not only do they have a library, they have people there who will help you do research. All right? Anytime you give them a call. But this book is really the only one that deals with stone artifacts of just Oakland County. Written by my mentor in archaeology, Charlie Martinez. How many of you knew Charlie? Oh yeah, you're blessed to know him. Um, Charlie is an amazing archaeologist and historian. And he put together this book. And the most important thing I learned from Charlie is that it's not about that stone artifact. He said, don't get obsessed with that artifacts you're finding. It's the people who made them. And Charlie always said, Native Americans have their own traditions, histories, and beliefs that speak eloquently of their origin, life, and purpose in this world. He had a huge respect for indigenous history and culture and reflected in how he wrote. Now, where did he get the artifacts to analyze? The Oakland History Center. They have had donations of a lot of family collections. So the artifacts he mentions in that book and the ones I'm going to show are from that collection. Now, we're fortunate because the History Center has just been given a new collection from Charlie's son. Um, and that Mike, and, and that's up here. Uh, Mike McGinnis and Dave brought that for you to see today. 
We're working on the provenance. You're not going to see the name of what kind of projectile point it's there. We're working on that. But it's wonderful history to see. And you know what? You can touch it. Yeah, don't be afraid. You can't hurt stone. You know, when I work with students, I say, can I just touch that? Can I say, yeah, this is OK. You can touch it. I'll talk about that in a minute. The other source of the book, how many of you know Rich Stamps? Oh, I have a good, yeah, Rich Stamps, my, my other mentor in archaeology. He and uh, Rich Zarell, who'd been one of his students at OU, put together a survey of archaeological resources as of 1980. That's not available. But if you have a question, which is uh, to answer it. Here's why it's not available. After the book was published, people went out and did huge amounts of damage to the sites that were mentioned in the book. And, and that's a problem, particularly with Native American burial sites. That's hugely a problem. So, so now it's not, but much of the good stuff about it is in Charlie's book. And as most people know, the primary artifact, stone artifact we have in Oakland County, are projectile points. A lot of people call these arrowheads, all right, collectively. They're not all arrowheads. Only one is, all right, only one. That's a knife point. This is a spear point or a knife point. How come we don't know? It's old, all right? And remember, the problem with archaeology is you never find whole stuff. My son always says, just one time, come home with something whole that you found, <laughs> not pieces of something. So the wooden piece that would have been shafted to it would have been small for a knife, long for a spear point, but they look remarkably the same. Here's a spear point. That's the only arrow point there. And here's another knife point. But they're all artifacts that we have in Oakland County. How were they found? Most of them by farmers when you plowed in the springtime and you turned up the earth, all right? And they went into private collections. Some are at Cranbrook, a few, and many are in our Oakland History Center. Now, when we think about the archeological record, it's broken into three big chunks. The Paleo-Indian site from about 12,000 to 9,000. In Oakland County, we can go back about 9, 10,000. And then we move into the Archaic period and then into the Woodland period. And they're broken down into uh, early, middle, and late, too. But you want to think about this. Indigenous people don't measure time like that. Years to indigenous people, <coughs> excuse me, are very different. Let me let Robin Kimmer explain it best. Indigenous knowledge teaches that time is not a linear progression, but a cycling that is interconnected and interdependent. Time is more a circle than a straight line. That's hard to get my brain around. My brain that in school learned about timelines and years, that's difficult. You'll hear indigenous people talk about, oh, it's been since time immemorial time before we have memory of it. I always used to ask Eric when we he'd talk about an Odawa event that happened, well, what year was that? And he'd just look at me and said, it was before this and after that. And that makes more sense, doesn't it? We all forgot the years anyway, you know, but we remember things happening in sequence. So if we think, though, we'll use this now because it's the way we look at artifacts. Paleo-Indian nomadic hunters and gatherers. For Oakland County, we only have a few artifacts. Couple reasons. They're very old. Think about the time period. And they're very deep. Remember, if you've ever been part of archaeology, the older stuff is the deeper stuff. So they're going to be deeper in the ground. The most common that we've found is what we call a fluted spear point. That's a flute. It was an indentation, and that's where the shaft was hafted to the spear point. Now think about this, though, how that was made. I still have difficulty conceptualizing how you take a piece of rock, and then you take another rock, and you make that. Think about the skill, the time, the patience of doing that. That's amazing. Now, where was that one found? We have three in Oakland Township and two in West Bloomfield, uh, near, near the uh, Walled Lake. Now, that's, that's the ones that, as of the two sources Charlie used, that we know of, 
all right? Some in private collections could be. Some still there? Absolutely. You know, we've concreted over a lot of Oakland County, so, and we've paved it. So likely, there's some still there. And then we move into the archaic time period. Now the glaciers have receded, and things will change. New things to hunt, new things to gather. And technology will change. You'll see this, an agate basin. Charlie always describes it as one of the most beautifully crafted points. I think we have one up here. I saw this the other day, not too long, but there's one that looks like an agate basin. We have, oops, let me go back here. Just the one in Pontiac. That's the only one of that, that we know of. Brewerton points would come in that time period. Now this one I love because that was found about 20 feet from Independence Oaks County Park. I wish it had been 20 feet to the west, but it wasn't. Um, but it tells me we, we've got other artifacts in that area. And I always tell, this is a time of year when we have our, our naturalist crew is out before the vegetation comes out. Uh, particularly on waterways that have eroded with spring rains, this is a time to be looking for artifacts. And then copper projectile points, very special. Um, where were we mine? What township were we mining copper in Oakland County? None. All right. What does this tell us about these folks? They were trading in big networks. This would have come from the Lake Superior area. So now archaic people are trading with each other. We have one in Groveland, up near one of our parks, and in Orion, and one in White Lake Township, we, we know of. And then we'll begin to see things like this, the barbed axes, the tools. That one discovered in around 1930 in Waterford Township. And here's the trick part. Stone tools can look a whole lot like rocks, all right? So here, this one. Is it just a plain old rock, or is it a stone tool? What do you think? Yeah, that's a hole. But think about that. If you had that in your rock garden, you might not recognize it. Here, this one. That comes from around my little pond in my house. <laughs> that I bought at Lowe's in a whole bag of stone. And here, rock or tool. Ah, that's a little more recognizable as a hammer stone. Here, hmm, that's an ax head. It's tricky. I can remember when I first, we were digging, Charlie and Rich and I, at the Oliver Williams homestead on the shores of Silver Lake. Now, you know that the Williams family did in their memoirs mention an indigenous family out in that area. And we know of people right along Saginaw Trail. So as we were digging down, trying to find Oliver, Winters, uh, um, uh, Oliver Williams' log trading post, we were getting deep. And that's when I said, now we're going to find the lithic, the, the stone artifacts, the projectile points. I must have taken Charlie Martinez 50 rocks. And every time, nope, when he tossed it over his shoulder, nope, we never did find anything. But you begin to see an artifact in every rock. You know, that's not easy. But it does mean to keep our eyes open in Oakland County, because people still do find them. We had a family not long ago along uh, Paint Creek uh, who had a little piece of land there that found something. Now some special ones, banner stones. Make sure today you look, we have examples of banner stones up here, so you can see the size and the beautiful finish to them. We think banner stones belonged with an atlatl. An atlatl was an improvement in a way to throw a spear, further, stronger, and with more accuracy. But it needed a weight. Now, how did we know about atlatls? Because in the late 1800s, the mid-1800s, there were people on the planet that were still using these. So that was a movement in technology. So we think that's what a banner stone was. And then we have gorgets. Gorgets have two holes. You can see a couple up here. The best guess is ornamentation, that it might have been ornamentation. And then we don't have these. There's only been three we know of with Charlie and Rich's work, bird stones. Little tiny things that are shaped like a bird. And we don't know what those were used for. Now, all of those things up until 1980 
we had 13 sites in eight townships where those kinds of things were found. So we can add those. And then we'll move to woodland. Farming will begin. And now we'll see some changes. Burial mounds. Um, we're not a big mound area, Oakland County. The, they're gone. Uh, the, the only visible mounds really are in Grand Rapids and Norton Mounds. But some were just ceremonial, but most were burial mounds. And another big change, pottery. Pottery comes with farming. Think about that. You need to store food now, storing rice and, and grain. And, and as you're farming, storing corn in particular, and even vessels used for cooking. So we'll see pottery traditions. They'll start with kind of rough as people develop the techniques of working with clay. Early woodland, we only have one example in commerce. In commerce. And I'm seeing <laughs> my friend back there, Ruth, who said, yes, that's commerce. We've got that. That's the only example. Now, we have, we have no middle woodland that we know of, but late woodland. Look at the difference. Look at the difference in pottery. And we have examples in Avon and in Troy and in Farmington. Of the, of the late woodland. We have one thing from the middle woodland, a Snyder's Point, and here it is ah, in my hand right here. I didn't take it, Mike McGinnis, tell them I borrowed it from the <laughs> Oakland History Center, and here's why. This was found in Groveland Township on what today is the northeast corner of Groveland Oaks County Park. This is the only artifact that we know of that was found on park land. Park land. It's about 2,000 years old. It's big. Snyder's points were big. They're not super common. Ohio has more than we had. But there's something about holding in your hand an artifact. You know, you can look at a photo and stuff, but imagine, I always say, someone 2,000 years ago created this. It's broken. So I wonder, was it a bad one when they made it? It was broken. Did it broke after? Who left it for me? You know, you got to go up and touch one of those. That's the connection, you know, to actually hold something in your hand that that's old. And it connects you with indigenous people. Now, we also know we have a lot of private collections still. There's one that Peter Shoemaker. Peter Shoemaker, this is his homestead. Addison Oaks on the east side. And we know in the family records he had a big collection he collected as he plowed every spring. Unfortunately, the family doesn't know where it's at. Um, it's probably in a garage somewhere and no one knows its value. But we know there are a lot of them. We know for sure that Addison one. We know of one in Rose still in a family. We know of one in White Lake. And we know of one in Royal Oak. I would bet there was one in every township. And people move away, and, and people have a box, and, but those are valuable parts of our history. And then another thing to look at is um, Wilbur Hinsdale Archaeology, Archaeological Atlas, 1931. He put together, he was an archaeologist, everything he could find about indigenous people up to 1931. All right. So he went through old records, field reports, everything. It's all online. The, the whole book is there. And then he created this series of maps for regions. Uh, you saw the one with the Pontiac villages on it. He put things like mounds and villages and earthworks. In Oakland County, we created our own based just on what we had in Oakland County. So we did burial grounds, ceremonial mounds, irregular earthworks, and villages. We have a few of these left in the county, but it's online. Um, so you, you still have access to a high resolution uh, um, map. All right? And then you, you've got my email on there. You can always email me and I can send that to you. But it's useful because it tells us, here's where we think villages were. We know of two in Southfield because they became reservations. We know of one on the south shore of, of um, Bald Eagle Lake in Brandon. We know of the, an Addison one right near where Peter Shoemaker gathered those artifacts. His farm is right near there. We know of two in Oakland Township, one in White Lake, actually two in White Lake. One's right along the shore, we think. And then 
the Pontiac one, here in Avon, one in Commerce, and then in Lyon, two uh, in Lyon Township. But think about that. How do you know a village was there? Now, we build with stone foundations. So we know of old sites by foundation, even if it's under the ground now. You saw pictures of, of indigenous housing. Um, they didn't use foundations. Well, how do you know where it is, where there was one? Well, sometimes people who are early to the area will mention it. Usually they'll say it might have been a hunting camp, but it could be a village. A village is some place, and you'll see in a minute, where it's used over time but not at the same time of year. That's tricky, you'll see that in a minute. But here's how we know where a village was, trash. When people stay in a village a long time, they leave trash behind. And that's the main thing, you find middens of prehistoric trash that's left. And so some of those are archeologically discovered through trash. And then burial grounds. You often see burial, you know, probably notice that villages often near water, that was common. Burial grounds near villages, so the one at Addison, one near Avon, the one near Pontiac, one in Troy, and one on the Bloomfield-Troy border, one in Commerce, and then one in Farmington. Now, were there more? Yes, but sadly, burial grounds were desec desiccated. You know, people just didn't care. Um, thought, well, maybe I can find a few artifacts in there, and I'm not worried about the bones. It's my farmland. I just plow it over. And then we have a few areas of mounds. The most significant was said to be in Groveland, up near Naren Lake uh, in the high part of Groveland Township. It was likely three, maybe as many as five mounds. Our only other real example, we have uh, in Orion there were mounds, and then we have some examples on the Independence-Waterford border. There could have been more, but again, those were flattened over time. So we have all of this history, you know, all of these connections. And we don't have specifics. We don't know what village was where, what its name was. But then you want to think about, so what does it tell us? What does the archaeological record tell us? Well, it has its limits. Helen Tanner says it best. The archaeological record permits only occasional glimpses into the cultural past. Evidence from the soil speaks softly and indistinctly. It's there, but there's a lot of missing pieces to it. So we can't just depend on the archeological record. We really need to think more about the lifestyle, the culture of the Anishinaabek. And it was based on seasonal migration pattern. In spring, in summer, to fall, to winter, a moving pattern based on resources. So in springtime was a time when people went to the maple sugar camps and made maple sugar and maple syrup and planted the crops at the summer village to be ready for fall. And then in summer, caring for the crops in what was usually called a summer village, gathering berries, some to eat and some to dry for a harsh Michigan winter. And then in fall, harvesting crops, corn and beans and squash, and going to the wild rice area. Wild rice was a critically important spiritual, cultural, and food crop for the Anishinaabek. And a lot of fishing, because fish could be dry. Lake sturgeon, one of the most important. Remember, we wiped it out. When, when non-indigenous people got here, they didn't like the taste of sturgeon. And so, they, in many cases, they just de destroyed sturgeon, the, the sturgeon. And then in winter, the group would break into smaller family sized groups because of lack of resources, and then head into more interior areas. But ice fishing was done, and of course, hunting. So this seasonal pattern, and going back to the same places, it wasn't that you were nomadic and wandering. You had your wild rice camp, you had your sugar camp. But think about that. That meant transportation was important, which meant trails to walk on and waterways. We know the Anishinaabek made great use of water. 
So that's another way to think about Oakland County connections. Where were our trails? Three big ones, the Saginaw, the Shiawassee, and the Grand River. We would end up turning them into roads. And then we also had a whole lot of secondary trails that were crisscross Oakland County. Those are our indigenous connections. That's what people moved along. And that got me thinking. When I first started working for parks over 10 years ago, I was interested in the trails. We're known for our trails, by the way. We're known for our trails. And it occurred to me, how do we know where to put a trail? When we get a new piece of land that we purchase or we're, we're given, how do we know where to put a trail? Dan Stencil, my boss, um, at that time said, it's simple, leg ball. We make use of the trails that are already there. Oh, I said. He said, when you, our, all our parks were once farms. Farmers have trails. Oh, yes. Here's the Esler Trail. Rose Oaks, beautiful trail. You got to try it. Goes out to what now is Esler Lake. Here's John Esler. And then it occurred to me, how did John Esler know where to put his trail out to the lake? Hmm. What if he used a trail that was already there? One historian said there was a Native American trail to every lake in Oakland County. He'd bet money on it. So it occurred to me, I have a new way of looking at our trails. Now I think this trail was a farmer's trail, and maybe he put it on top of a Native American trail. A different way to be walking and think about the history you're walking on. And waterways. Oh, we know the Anishinaabe made good use of water. We have th four major rivers, the Clinton, and the Rouge, and the Huron, and the Shiawassee. And then we have a gazillion little tributaries and creeks. Some of them today may look too small to navigate or too shallow, but remember, we're talking at times when there were more waterways, and they were deeper. So we have water trails and footpaths, all of us that help us connect to indigenous people. And then we want to think about resources. We know we've screwed up a lot of the environment in Oakland County. None of us are going to say we haven't. So we know that there are some things that were there that are gone now. So how do we know 200, 300 years ago, what would the Anishinaabek have found here? Well, we actually have a glimpse of it. These maps are called the Vegetation Circa 1800. They're part of the Michigan Natural Re Features Inventory. They're all online. They look like this. They're a map that shows what the land looked like around 1800, when the Anishinaabek would have been in Oakland County. How did they make them? They went to the survey maps, which were done starting in 1815 in Michigan up through the 1820s in Oakland County. And the surveyors wrote things down. Here was rolling land with white and black oak. So we have these glimpses of the past. And then we create these maps. Oakland County had a lot of oak hickory forest. Hence our name, Oakland County. We were known for oak trees. Now think about that. Just from what you already know about the Anishinaabek, you know oak trees were of value. We had five kinds of oaks, and everyone had unique things that it could give indigenous people. Food, and medicine, and technology. What'd you do with oak bark? What about twigs off a tree? And lowly acorns that you hear crunching with your lawnmower and the wind. Ah, abundant, storable, nutritional. What a food source. All right, easy to store. And in beech sugar maple, look where they're at, the south part of our Oakland County. Huge amount, maple sugaring. And this is the traditional way. A lot of pictures you'll see are with copper pots after trading has come in. If you want to see the really authentic one, go to Zebra Wing Center. If you haven't been there, go. Put it on your history to-do list. And if you've been there, go back. There's always something new there. It's a great way to learn about Anishinaabe culture. And then what about cedar and birch? Very important. Eric Hemingway made with the National Park Service some short little videos. I've got the link on your resource about how the Anishinaabe used different trees. And then swamps. We had a lot of them. Just read the early surveys and we eliminated a lot of them. 
technically between 41 and 60 percent, we have figured. And why? Farmers wanted more land. They hated mosquitoes, but that wasn't what they were worried about. They needed to drain it so they had more farmland. Well, it came to be a problem, because what do wetlands do? Big sponges taking in extra water. Purifying system. So it came to haunt us. So what do we do with wetlands now? We try to protect them, all right? Going back in time. But it has to do again with the difference in perception. Indigenous view, nuisance, no. Indigenous people identify wetlands as gardens, land and water spaces to gather and harvest various plants and plant parts for medicine, food, and material. Nuisance versus garden, different perspective. Now, did indigenous people love mosquitoes? No, they didn't. But they look beyond the mosquitoes to think about what can we find here. Lowly cattail. Ah, there's edible parts. The strands of it can make great mats and even little toys. And then we know we have a lot of lakes, 430 of them, a lot of lakes. We know they were important. And one of the most important things, wild rice, right? This is wild rice, but what happened to it? Manumin in Anishinaabemowin. Manumin is more than just a food to the Anishinaabe. It's considered a sacred gift from Gitchimana to the Creator. The Anishinaabe have been respectfully gathering manumin around the Great Lakes area for centuries. Operative word, respectfully gathering. We weren't good at that, were we? Respectfully gathering. So what happened with wild rice? Well, an expert, Roger Lapine, who's from Lac Vaudesire, Lake Superior, um, he describes it as the poster child for an and degraded species. What happened? Logging, water sports, invasive plants, and pollution essentially wiped it out. Now, most tribal nations are doing wildlife restoration. Did we have it in Oakland County? Absolutely we did. Do we still have it? Yes. Here's an example, a photo from wild rice in Oakland County. And I'm proud to say, two examples, independence oaks and rose oaks. That's the only parts in all of this part of southern Michigan. What a treasure. Let me tell you, I tell those naturalists, don't you let anything happen to that wild rice. We're learning from the Anishinaabe experts how to, how to manage it and how to extend it. Great book, Manumin by Barb, uh, Barb Barton, about wild rice, the harvesting, incredibly good read. So we have indigenous connections, absolutely. Do we have specifics? No, but we don't need that, all right? We have an archeological record, and we have trails and rivers that we know were utilized, and we know the resources that were available. So the trick becomes, how do we honor those connections? You know, what do we do? Well, one thing, you come to a thing like this and you learn more, and then we work on filling in our gaps, all right? I've given you some resources. You know, the problem is not having a gap. The problem is leaving the gap there, and not trying to fill it ever so slowly even. Some more gap fillers, masters of empire. If you think you know about the French and the fur trade and the Straits of Mackinac, oh boy, you are gonna learn more from this book. It's excellent. And one of my favorites, short read, PDF, online, free, I can email it to you, an indigenous people's history of the United States. How to look at history to indigenous eyes. And then make sure you read one of her books. I would suggest you start with Braiding Sweetgrass. But listen to her own words. She has several of her presentations uh, online to hear. Anishinaabe 101. Uh, Judy Pamp, who did the Wild Rice quote, brilliant educator from Zebuwing. Eric has some here. Short little presentations that the Michigan History Center put together. And then what about the places we work and the groups we work with? How can we help them? Well, you're probably seeing a lot of land acknowledgments. You're beginning to see those. Oakland County's working on one. Uh, we have it at Parks. But wait a minute. Egbo was here doing a presentation on indigenous history and culture, and she didn't start with one? Oh, she did. 
She started right here. This is a land acknowledgement, but it's not just a few words on a slide or a handout. It was my whole presentation. I see my whole presentation today as a land acknowledgement because you can't just do a simple little phrase and say, check it off, we've done our indigenous history something. You have to do more. You have to do more. I'll give you some examples from Oakland County Parks. We do have, in every park history, a land acknowledgement for each of our parks. But we're going beyond that. Little tiny things. We have a lot of trees, and people like to know what they are. So we often put signs by our trees. And now we're going to be putting the Anishinaabe Moan word for the tree along it. And even more important, service berry. Oh, how many of you love service berry? We're getting into service berry time, aren't we? Beautiful. When you drive through Oakland County, those white, the first thing whites you see. So yes, we can put the Anishinaabe Moan name, but how can we go more? How about we talk about how the Anishinaabe used service berry? And when our naturalists are out and talking, and doing the trails, how about blending that in with what we say? And we're redoing every sign in our Oakland County parks. We're good at signs, by the way. I hope when you come to a park, you read our signs, especially the new ones. We are putting a lot of time into them. Every single sign will have an indigenous connection. So instead of having the indigenous sign, one little one here, every sign will show. There is nothing in a park that doesn't have an indigenous connection. This one is about pollinators, but it has the Anishinaabe way of looking at plants. Helpers and healers, all right? What a different way to look at plants. And then we've just created a small little brochure. We have a lot of handouts we give. This is on indigenous history in our parks. And here's an interesting one we've worked on. We set our parks on fire every now and then. All right. It's called prescriptive burning. We do it very carefully. We have a fully trained staff that does that. But it makes people nervous when they drive by and a park is on fire. So we do have to talk about why we are doing this. But now we are also saying it is nothing new. Indigenous people have used prescriptive burning for hundreds of years. Go to Walpole Island every spring or fall and you'll see that happening. So it's just another way of continuing those indigenous connections. And then I think the best way for our park system, and I really think all of us, is to carry out the mission of our park system, to care for the natural environment, preserve the land and open space for future generations. Isn't that what the Anishinaabe were all about? Indigenous knowledge just teaches us that we are not the owners or masters of the earth but rather it's stewards and caretakers. A different way of viewing things. And that's what I think is the best way to honor indigenous connections, is to carry on what they put in place and what they're still doing. And we can be part of that process. One final quote. Mother Earth is not a resource, she's an heirloom. She's that little carved box that played the Blue Danube. She's not a ham. Thank you.